Let's now use vector methods to solve problems. And we'll start with something that we already mentioned in the last lecture, but we did it ap apologetically because we were using some of the properties that we had not yet established. But now proving those properties was part of your homework so we can think of them as established and so now we can use them unapologetically. Okay, so we'll start with Pythagoras' theorem and I brought this prop back because the first time I used it we were not filming and I spent so much time doing this uh, that, yeah. So what we have here is four identical right triangles with sides A, B, and C. Let's call the shorter side A, the longer leg B, and the hypotenuse C. And we can arrange them in the square, one in the same square, in two different ways. The first way is like this. And the empty space, the smaller square is A by A, and the larger square is B by B. So the overall empty space is A squared plus B squared. And then when we rearrange them like this, And now the empty space is a square that's C by C. So it's C squared. And because it's one and the same overall square and the same four triangles, the two empty spaces were the same, must be the same. So A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Very, very simple. But I never would have thought of it. Right? It just requires tremendous ingenuity to think of something like this. So yes, yeah, so I'm not saying it's complicated. It's very simple when someone else has thought of it. I can same thing about squaring uh, of the parabola by Archimedes. It's pretty simple once someone else had, has thought of it for you. So how are we going to do it with our new methods? Okay, so now everything will be justified. So we start just a right triangle, okay, with sides A, B, and C. And in problems like this, it's up to us to impose a vector view on what's going on. So it's entirely up to you how you do it. You can point A and B out this way, thinking of this as the origin. And I can point C this way. And I can say that C is B minus A. And this is by no way the right way to do it or the unique way to do it or anything like that. We could have pointed A this way, sort of violating the overall idea that everything comes from the origin. It means that A is actually this vector right here, going like this. It's just that for convenience, I drew it here. And then I can say that C equals A plus B. Or I could have pointed, even in this picture, I could have pointed C in the opposite direction, and then I would have written that C equals minus A minus B. Any of these approaches is up to you. It's entirely up to you how you impose the vector view on the geometric problem that you're presented with. Okay. So we'll go with the original one. I kind of feel like it's the natural one, although a lot of us don't like minus signs. You know, maybe if I had to do it all over again, I would at least arrange it so that it's alphabetical and it would be A minus B. For that, I would need to point C the other way. That's what I would do if I practiced uh, before the lecture. But there was another problem that I did practice. So you guys are in good hands. Okay, so what do we do now? We dot both sides of the equation with itself. So we'll dot C with C and B minus A with B minus A. I believe this step to be completely uncontroversial. If one vector equals another, then its dot product with itself equals the dot product of the other vector with itself. What do I say? I want to say, well, why are we dotting both sides? I think in this case, because we know what we're going towards. We want to have C squared, and that's the way to get C squared. Okay, so what do we do now? Can we, I'm going to use my most reviled word in math, the word that I revile the most. What word is that? Can you guess? When it, when it comes to expressions like this. That's right. Foil. I'm not going to go off on a rant of just how wrong 
the concept of foil is. I see, but can you foil? Can you multiply it out the way it would a normal algebraic expression? And the answer is yes. We just have to use the distributive law three times. Once you have the basic distributive law, you have this combined distributive law. Because in the first application, we can just think of this as a single vector and distribute this dif difference. And we would get... And now we can distribute each one of these. So it's a second application of the distributive law. You will notice, of course, commutativity is kind of mixed in because when the distributive law is stated, it's usually one way or the other. So the way I use it is with the vector following the sum. And here, the sum follows the vector, but that doesn't matter because I can switch them by commutativity and then switch them back if I have to. So we have b dotted with b. So, ah, uh, now we go back and remember that we were considering a right triangle. In a moment, we'll make it a non-right triangle and then we'll get the law of cosines. I mean, everything seems to come for free, but for a right triangle, we just came up with how you state in vector speak that two vectors are orthogonal. You do it in terms of the dot product. Uh, the dot products vanish, and so we have A dotted with A. And now, now that we have our vector answer, answer in terms of the things that we work with, which is addition, there's no addition left, multiplication by numbers, there's no multiplication by numbers left, all we have is dot products. We now go, go back, back and, and interpret it geometrically, and we find that this is c squared, the length of c squared, right? So now I will say just a couple words about the notation. So I will use this notational system where the letter itself without the arrow above it indicates the length of the vector. You guys are okay with it? So instead of saying in a book, I prefer to say length of A because I prefer clarity over brevity. But when I'm writing a lot and my space here is very limited, I'll err on the side of brevity and you'll just bear with me. So what's the conclusion? C squared equals A squared plus B squared. There it is in all of its glory. No ingenuity required. No sophisticated algebra, just a straightforward application of algebraic intuition and algebraic rules, right? So there is some brilliance uh, that went unnoticed by us, and I don't feel like I have full grasp of it, but that went into the development of the simple vector-based framework, right? Because what required incredible ingenuity is now become a routine matter, so much so that uh, it took me a long time to realize that I'm not, a slipping, I'm not slipping a fast one by myself. You know, it just seems way too simple, but it should inspire us that, you know, way too simple works like this. Okay, that's great. Now, for the law of cosines, it's the exact same thing, except this triangle doesn't need to be a right triangle. Now this can be an arbitrary angle. This is still length A. The angle is now gamma. This is still the vector A and its length A. And everything remains valid except for the crossing out of the two dot products which are equal. So now they survive and we now remember what these dot products are in terms of the geometric quantities. And of course, it's the length of A times the length of B times the cosine of the angle between them. And there is your minus sign. And there is your law of cosine. And you might be wondering, if I had gone with an arrangement where A points this way, B points this way, and so C is A plus B, where would that minus sign come from? Good thing to think about in your own time, right? What is that minus sign? Why is it there? Is it, does it, is it because of this minus? Right? What if it, this had been a plus? Because it's up to you how you arrange the vector. So think it through. So with a plus, would the law of cosines end up being plus 2ab cosine gamma? Of course not, but you'll figure it out. Mm -hmm.